Thanks, and thanks for having me out here. Uh, this has been great so far. I'm sure it'll be better going forward. Um, I changed my title because I wanted to tell you what the talk was about, which the other title didn't. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is, um, I'm probably going to focus more on the physics, um, but along the way we're going to learn a bit about how Blue Waters was helpful. Um, and so what I'm going to do is try to explain to you uh, what unconventional superconductors are, um, the fact that we don't really know how they work, and how we're trying to figure out how they work using high performance computing. So that's basically going to be the basic idea. Um, this has uh, mostly been done by a student, Avde uh, postdoc Avdesh Narayan, who has moved on to uh, Zurich, and uh, Brian Busemeyer, who's an NSF graduate research fellow um, in my group. Uh, so uh, to talk about superconductors, it's useful to talk about superfluids. And a superfluid is a really special state, and I have a movie. Um, so it's a little bit hard to see, it's from the 60s. But what they have here is, I'm gonna pause it for a second. Um, that did not pause it. Okay, so what's here is that um, you have a container and you have a porous uh, bottom to it. And if you look here, there's nothing going through. The, there's helium in here and it's not following through the bottom, right? It's just sitting there. And uh, what, they're going to, what they're doing is that they are uh, pumping on that. They're, they're putting a negative or a, a pressure differential on it. And you can see that it's evaporating. There's bubbles in the helium going through here. And as they cool it down, this is 2.17 Kelvin, so this is very cold. You see it starts to bubble more and more and more. And what you're going to see, phase transition and then pop. It's right now in a superconducting state. Now that is a superconductor, a superfluid, I should say. And suddenly it loses all viscosity, and now it's flowing out through the bottom of the thing. So it's a really strange state where the fluid doesn't have any viscosity at all. If you have pores or anything, it'll just go right through it. It'll go right up the edges of different of a container. It'll do things that are really strange um, for us. Um, so it's a pretty pretty cool thing. You see the, the fluid is just pouring right out of the bottom, right through the bottom of that, that container because it has no viscosity. Um, okay, so superconductivity is basically the electrons becoming a superfluid. So you have a material and the electrons are able to flow around without any resistance and without any viscosity at all. And what that means is that you can pump a bunch of current through it. So for example, you can buy these things, um, apparently in Chinese or Japanese, I'm not sure. Um, but these are about the size of a, a lamp cord, right? And you can pump about 5,570 amps through that, right? Compared to one amp, like one amp on a normal lamp cord. So you can pump a lot of current through that without losing anything, no transmission losses at all. Um, this has to be around uh, 10 Kelvin to do this. <laughs> it has to be very cold, um, but you can do it. Um, and actually, if you look out, um, the EIA uh, in, the, in our government keeps track of these things, how much power we lose through just the power lines. And about 5% of our power is lost through transmission. Just, that's it, it's just gone because it goes through our lines. If we made these out of superconductors and somehow could get them to be 10 Kelvin, um, that could be zero, that could be nothing. Um, this, this kind of technology, this kind of material is also used in things like MRI um, to make the big magnetic fields, um, sensors uh, uh, that was referred to just now for quantum computing, uh, electric motors, you can make electric motors out of this and really uh, improve the efficiency of those things as well if you can get it cold enough, right? Or if you can get the temperature at which it becomes superconducting high enough, right, one or the other. So that's a good motivation for working on this. Okay, so how do they work? Um, it's a little bit hard to explain if you don't know quantum mechanics. Uh, but here's a picture, an analogy. As we learned this morning, we should use analogies of how they kind of work. And this was figured out actually in the 60s um, by people from Illinois, uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schreifer. Uh, and what they figured out is that superconductivity is caused by pairing. And to give you kind of an idea of how this works, you can look at this, this cool guy here. And what he's doing is he's surfing on a wake, right? You have the boat moving along, it creates a wake in the water, and he's uh, surfing on it, right? And he doesn't have to put any power into moving himself forward, he's just riding the wake, right? Um, and so something like this, if you put on the right rose-colored goggles, is happening in the materials. And the electrons are basically riding on each other's wakes, 
and that allows them to, be, to do superconductivity. Um, if you want more details, uh, give me about half a week and we can explain <laughs> the, the rest there. Um, but, but I want you to keep this picture in mind where um, a lot of times pairing is caused by one thing interacting with the water and then the water will interact with the other thing and that will allow them to move without resistance. Okay, um, so there's actually two types of superconductivity, at least two types of superconductivity. Um, one is called conventional and conventional is defined kind of by what we know, right? And so these are the common behavior, um, uh, common materials. Uh, they behave uh, in what we would call a normal way. Um, they are generally low temperature, and we know how they work. They work with these kind of wakes in the atomic lattice, in the, in the, in the nuclear lattice. Um, and then we have this other class, which we call unconventional, and we mostly call them unconventional because we don't understand how they work very well. Um, they're pretty rare. We really know of only a few, a handful of instances of unconventional superconductivity. Um, we can get very high temperature. Um, the temperature is very different. Uh, see this blue and this, this yellow, these are the, the unconventional ones. And you know, and I don't really like that they did this, but there's a little bit of a break in this graph. It goes from 50 to 100. So it goes up quite a lot. Um, and it matters a lot for technology because here we can use liquid nitrogen, here we have to use liquid helium or hydrogen. Um, so there's a big expense difference there. And we don't know the origin. Um, so we don't know how that works. So um, just to kind of convince you that we kind of do know how conventional superconductors work, and I'm going to motivate somewhat how we think unconventional ones might work, um, let's talk about uh, how they work. So, um, so we have electrons, and they kind of float around in a lattice of nuclei, right? So the red things are nuclei, and the green things are electrons. And when the electrons move around, they kind of make a wake in the, in the nuclear lattice. The nuclear motion kind of mo moves around, and the electrons can pair due to that motion. So it's similar to that wake that I was talking about before. Um, and what you can do is you can actually measure the coupling between the electrons and the lattice, right? So you can either measure that using transport uh, measurements, I'm not gonna get into how you do that, and you can also measure it using the superconducting temperature. And, um, and then you can plot them against each other and they line up pretty well. And most of the difference here we understand is basically uh, measurement error and other things like that. So we kind of understand how this works. Um, for the uh, unconventional superconductors, again, we don't really know how they work, but we need to figure out a method that will tell us how they should work. Um, and so what we do is we try to, we're trying to come up with what we call descriptors. So given that a material has a, B, or C, or D, some properties, we want to figure out what the probability that it is superconducting, right? And if it's perfect descriptor, like this, like these, um, what I was showing you before, then this probability function is going to be one or zero, right? It's always going to be true, it's always going to be false. Um, so uh, we don't have that, A, B, C, D, um, but we also need to be able to calculate this pretty accurately for a given material. Um, and that's where the high temperature superconductivity is going to come into play. Um, and so we need to compute this accurately, and we also need to compare the predictions that you would get of whether it's superconducting or not with things that are superconducting with things that are not superconducting, right? Because otherwise, how do you know whether it's working or not, right? Okay, so we need to compute this very accurately. So we need to take these materials and we need to compute their pro some property, which we think is important for superconductivity, accurately, right? Is that clear, everybody with me still? Good, okay. So that's where the high, high performance computing comes in. Um, so, the best way to do this is go back to Schrodinger, go back to the 20s. They told us how to do this, right? So, this is quantum mechanics, right? So, electrons behave according to quantum mechanics. And so, there's a mathematical equation which we're told that, you know, if we solve it correctly, we'll get all the answers we'd like. We can calculate the color of this, you know, whether it's transparent, that sort of thing. Um, so, what we're doing, what our group is really focusing on, is really just solving this equation with as minimal approximations as possible, okay? Which includes all the electron-electron interactions, includes all these things. Um, and the big issue with this, the reason that this is difficult, is that we're really solving for a wave function. Um, the wave function is going to tell us um, all the probabilities, all the, all the information we need to know, and that's a high dimensional function, right? So that's a function of the position of each of the individual particles in, in the simulation, right? So it's a very high dimensional function. 
uh, difficult to solve for. Uh, so the way we're dealing with this is to use uh, Diffusion Monte Carlo. And this is a kind of a picture of how this works. Uh, you can map solving that equation onto a stochastic process uh, of little walkers, right? And so this is an example of solving uh, the harmonic oscillator. If you've ever taken a quantum mechanics course, you've probably solved the harmonic oscillator. Who has taken a uh, quantum mechanics course? Yay, okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so you've solved this before, right? You know this is a terrible way to solve it, but we, we've done it. Okay, we're doing it here. So we're gonna give a guess. By the way, does anybody know the, uh, the, the ground state solution, what it looks like? It's a Gaussian, yeah, great. Okay, so this is our guess. It's a really bad guess, right? It's not a Gaussian at all, it's not, not that. So um, what we can do though is, is we can make these walkers. You can prove this, uh, I'm not doing it here, you make these walkers, and we're going to have two rules for these walkers. One is that they're going to diffuse left or right at random, and the other one is that they're going to die off when the potential here is large, and they're going to reproduce when the potential is low. Those are just two rules, right? And so you push it forward in time, and what happens is, you see, they're dying off where the potential is high, and they're reproducing when the potential is low, and then you accumulate the distant density of the walkers, and you get back the ground state, right? So this is a terrible way of solving the harmonic oscillator, but it's a very good way of solving very high dimensional problems. Um, because Monte Carlo scales very nicely in the number of dimensions. It's, it's actually very weakly scaling in the number of dimensions. Um, and so what happens is that no longer do we have a function which represents our wave function, we have walkers whose density represents our wave function. And so um, when you go through this and actually apply this to uh, complex systems of fermions, of sorry, electrons, uh, uh, you end up having to make two mild approximations. Um, one is uh, a fixed node approximation. Um, we have to fix the zeros of the wave functions. I'm not gonna get into the technical details there, and effective core potentials. But I just wanted to let you know that, that those are our main approximations. Um, and so a real simulation looks kind of like this. So you have your nuclei here, and this, this is magnesium oxide. So the oxygen is red and the magnesium is, is um, is yellow there, uh, and the paths of the electrons look like this. So these are all the paths of the electrons that we're, we're moving through. So this is basically one sample. So we take the electrons at one place and they kind of move them around through space, and this is what one simulation looks like. So we have to calculate um, all these properties as we're moving these electrons through space, and that's basically the, the simulation. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like a big mess, huh? Um, but we try to make some sense out of it. Okay, so uh, the first thing we did with this, this technique, um, probably about five or six years ago, thanks. Um, five or six years ago, um, you know, people said, well, you know, this is a good method. It's been around for a long time. It's probably been around for 30 or 40 years now, um, longer than I've been around at least. And um, uh, it hadn't really been applied to these uh, types of materials that these unconventional superconductors are. And so what we did was we said, okay, we, we really need to see, can we get good and accurate answers using this technique? Um, and so this is basically extensive benchmarking that we've done. Um, I just wanna point out that each one of these points is often one project, right? It's often like one XSEED project or it's one, you know, or has been historically. Um, and I also wanna point out that each one of these uh, points that I circled here were done in blue waters. So, Blue Waters has really enabled us to be able to go and check and make sure that this new technique um, can really get high accuracy. And just for comparison, this is a density functional theory um, result there. So this is experiment and this is theory. You wanna be on this line and, and we're pretty much on it. Um, and you know, kind of the more standard techniques are, are very much off it for these types of materials um, because of their, their worse accuracy. And we get many things within 1% or, or maybe a few percent errors. So it's a very highly accurate technique if you're willing to pour the CPU cycles in it, right? Okay, um, so going back to superconductors, I wanna, we wanna set up a computational experiment. Remember I said that we want to be able to compute some property um, for both superconducting and non-superconducting materials, and then see, well, can we get a relationship between that property and the superconductivity, right? So here's an experiment. This is a technique, um, I'm not technique, this is a, a class of materials uh, with um, barium in, 
in the middle here. And um, you have some transition metal, which are these red things here. And these uh, other things is arsenic. So not very healthy to eat, I would say. Um, but it's pretty safe once you make the material. And the uh, purple here is, is the electron density. Um, so most of the business is going on in these little layers going through the material, right? Um, so uh, you can actually make this with chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper. You can make the same, same structure. And it only superconducts with iron. Put in iron and superconducts everything else it doesn't. So that's pretty interesting. And we wanted to know why. Um, so first we wanted to do our due diligence and try to figure out, well, do we actually have an accurate simulation of this thing? So um, we went through and um, computed uh, something about the magnetism. So in these materials, um, the atoms have each a magnetic moment on them, and it can arrange either all aligned or it can arrange kind of uh, in various ways. Um, and this is a picture of this. So this is the magnetic moment. This means the magnetic moment is pointing this way, and this means the magnetic moment is pointing this way. Um, and uh, we managed to predict the ordering of all these materials bang on every time. And that's not something anybody's been able to do before, um, but we were able to do that with a high accuracy method. Um, okay, uh, so let's just put together this weight picture, the fact that we want to couple, we couple between the phonons and the lattice vibrations and the, um, and the electrons, and the fact that they have magnetism. So what we did was we came up with the description, which is based on the interaction between these magnetic moments and the electrons in the system. And I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip the details. We notice there's actually a really nice story how we noticed in certain materials the density responded and blah, 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 but I'll skip it and, and skip to the end. Um, so, uh, so what we did was we figured out, uh, uh, basically you look at the change of electron density divided by the change in the, in the spin and the magnetic moments, and what you find is all the superconductors lay in this pink region, which is kind of a, a, a happy medium when it's not too strong, because think about if you're trying to ride a wake and the boat's interaction with the water is too strong, the boat is sinking, so that's bad. Uh, so these are, these are kind of sinking, these are too bad, um, and these are too weak, so you kind of want a medium interaction to make a nice wake so you can kind of go along it. Um, and there are other criteria as well that you can get into, but we basically found a nice little happy medium for these materials. And we, know we had to do a bunch of calculations. We have um, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. We had 12 different materials that we looked at with this very high accuracy method, which hasn't ever been done before. Um, and so that was really useful. Um, so just to summarize, um, we were able to make a connection between some atomic scale and emergent behavior, which is really an interesting behavior for us physicists at least. Um, and the high performance is really necessary to study many materials. Um, we wouldn't be able to address all these different materials if we couldn't use these big machines. Um, we're actually making the data available through materials data facility um, and help with NCSA. Um, and so we expect that will be useful to people developing functionals and other things. Um, uh, this photo I wanted to mention was a photo saying that superconductivity research was dead. I mean, this is an article from Nature. It said superconductivity research is dead. I don't think that's true, but I wanted to use that photo for that reason. Uh, okay, and this is for the kind of the people who are interested in what Blue Waters did for us. Um, or just to give you an idea of what the problem we're trying to, to do is. Um, so we're, Monte Car we're using Monte Carlo. So we actually, on Mira, we've scaled up to a million threads. No problem, pretty much just straight linearly. This is strong scaling, same problem. Um, the issue that we often run into is that we actually have to do billions of very small matrix operations. And a lot of times people are not really set up for that, um, to do that, say, in parallel or, or even necessarily that efficiently. Um, you might have 200 or 500 elements, not very many. Um, one thing that we're working on is, is the workflow. Now that we're doing many materials and actually many different magnetic configurations, um, we're working on, with NCSA on, on workflows for this, this, these techniques. Um, and uh, there are other things that we're working on that might be interesting to uh, computer science types like feature extraction, um, with, uh, which I can talk to you more about maybe offline. And with that, I'll finish and take questions.